Not too bad. Uh, awake and uh, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, take your time if you need to settle in or, or have some tea or whatever. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, uh, like I tend to wake up very early in the morning. I mean, also because you know during the COVID time, moving to work, uh, you know, from home completely. We moved to Glaston with my partner, so we basically live on top of the hill, away from everything. <laughs> so it's it's cool. a different life. So like you know, wake up very early, go to bed. Like I mean early, but you know you've been you've been around for like ten hours, twelve hours at that point, so that's normal pretty much. So no, 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 I, I I'm settled in. I'm 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 here. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for joining. And um, yeah, I've heard Glastonbury is awesome. I haven't had a chance to visit it yet, but it seems like one of those really potent places in the world that's it's, one of those you know spiritual meccas or whatever absolutely i mean i i think it's you know it's akin to i mean sedona in the states like you know it's a uk sedona or maybe sedona is the you know is the u.s glastonbury <laughs> exactly it, like i said it, it's a very multi-layered place um there's a lot of you new age uh, let's say more mainstream spirituality and then there's something that goes much much deeper and uh, i mean i enjoy both to be fair uh, we haven't se- we haven't so much of uh you know of the mainstream you know new agey bits because you know there hasn't been able to be any uh you know any festivals i mean this place is a place that you would get something weird happening every weekend like you know the fairy ball or the drink mm-hmm. or dragons around town and now last year has been of course closed down but uh, the you know the, the underlying currents and the underlying energies of this place are still pretty much there so yeah i mean if you if you get the chance come and visit because it's uh, it's nice <laughs> i would love to i've heard from friends that have been there or that live there that there's literally people that dress like witches and wizards and just kind of oh yeah that's, <laughs> that's more or less normal there here no, is it's not absolute, too different no, it's like it's absolutely normal like it, it you know it, it, it it's it's there's also a lot of norm, norm, like normal people, you know, people that actually wouldn't want any of that. But over the years, there's been like some sort of like balance has formed between the various communities. Uh, I would say that the, I mean, the last year has been trying for everybody, right? So uh, it's, there's been a little bit of, I wouldn't say maybe friction being being created in the last year uh especially with the people that believe in the vaccine people don't believe in the vaccine people that believe in covid you know don't believe in covid uh, as i was telling you on instagram i mean i i always i had covid and it's been really bad <laughs> like like it's interesting there's also my partner we live together and she tested and she didn't she, she was fine pretty much while i spent three weeks you know in bed super high fever very very dark thoughts as well as like am i ever gonna get out of this you know mm-hmm. uh, so you know it, it was it's me for me i guess my my perspective like became strange so yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of that going down in town right now <laughs> so but i hope i hope things will get better for the summer because i mean there must be right it's been a while now <laughs> so <laughs> yeah well i've heard glastonbury festival is amazing and i'm glad you're feeling better yeah i think it's one of those things where when you encounter enough people who have had it or or it's like it becomes real i think now everybody's had people close to them that have had it i mean i feel feel like it's different than when when we were like last spring where i mean you know maybe you know maybe a friend of a friend of a friend had it right and it's like oh but now no not i mean in, in my in my friendship group you know even co-workers I can tell of tens of people who had it. Different, I mean, different levels. Some, some had it as bad as I uh, as I did. Some didn't have any symptoms, like my girlfriend. Um, I don't know anybody who's been hospitalized with it, but I was close to actually tell you know, Rian, my girlfriend's like, hey, uh, you know, call, call the ambulance because I, I don't know how to get out of it. Because of course, there's no cure. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> like, I mean, you, you. Thankfully, I feel like my magical practice helped because you know when you when you know enough of pranayama, when you know enough of meditation, it can help a lot. But as I always said, I always said you know to everybody I speak magic with, it's like yeah, magic helps, but 
you need you need a doctor too. <laughs> that's, that's, there's no way out, you know. Like, Sometimes antibiotics help. Yeah, Things I mean, like exactly. That. Like, and of course, it's 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 a very it's a slippery slope because who, what, what do we get? What do we put in our bodies? We, I mean, I'm not a scientist. I don't know. I just trust them, like right. And and it's it's problematic at times. I, I'm 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 fully aware, but you know, it's from, I, I I'm glad that I'm out. <laughs> Let's put it like that. So. <laughs> so, how did your magical practice help during that time? Because I feel like a good working spiritual system should be it should be most effective in the times when you most need it right like in the in the darkest times so i'm curious uh, how yeah. how magic panned out for you during those times i definitely agree with you um i believe that you know if if you do magic and you know just to read a book or just to know everything about a system and then you never put it into practice if you don't embody your magical practice uh, I don't think you're doing magic. <laughs> I think you're do. I think maybe you're studying magic, and that's great. That's fine. But no, no. What what I felt. I mean, my magic practice really helped. I feel on two different levels. One, like I said, you know, the ability of being able to to be with yourself. You know, even when when you're like your body doesn't doesn't answer you anymore. Even when you feel like you you have all these different inputs uh, on a very physical level and you you have no control over them. The ability to have a place inside yourself when you can retreat and you know it's sheltered and you know like it becomes pretty much like um let's say a phylactery for sanity if you want something that you know it's you know it's impervious because you you build it up over many years and that was that was good like i said there were moments where um it was dark but it wasn't like you know, in complete despair, like, uh, what am I gonna do? Am, am I gonna die? You know, things like that. I mean, I you could you can still entertain dark thoughts. I feel, but you know, that kind of um, I'm almost like diamond like shelter uh, gives you also a perspective. Also, it acts as a prism. You this this ideas comes into it, but then you can maybe like see them clearly and process them easily. That's what I would say more on a, on an energetic level. Uh, another another part of my practice is actually working with spirits like properly like you know I I don't really subscribe to the psychological model of magic it's something that you know I grew up with and it was interesting to entertain you know all demons and angels are part of our psyche um, I, I mean I don't think that's the reality anymore I think there's maybe roots of of those entities those awareness those consciousness in our psyche but I also found out over the years uh, um, and again that's my personal uh, perspective that they exist they exist uh, you know ontologically outside us and so if you have let's say like a coterie of spirits that you've been working with you can call upon them and <laughs> i mean I, I told the story um on i do this weekly um streams on my patreon and I, lots of like people that follow me and they're talking with them uh, they were like, how, what, what, did, what did you see? I was like, well, actually, it's weird, but I really had like this strange, almost like um, you know, lucid dreams where we were going around with this coterie of spirits. Or I, mean, I consider you know, spirit friends, right? Spirit allies, if you want. Going around squashing the little bugs around the house. <laughs> so, I mean, it, was it something that, I mean, when it comes to magic, I will never say that's the truth because I realized that truth is something that really exists outside uh, everything that we can truly grasp on this dualistic world we live in, it's beyond duality, right? But you can have glimpses. And so for me, that uh, was a glimpse of, okay, maybe maybe there exists a group of, you know, a spirit, a group of spirit allies that help me uh, fight this thing. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really grateful that, you know, at least I can say, hey, I didn't, I didn't completely waste the last 25 years of my life working on these things, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Something out of it. <laughs> Well, I think it's like you exist as an aspect of my psyche also, you know, and it's kind of like, like, it's, yes, it's both. That's how I like to reconcile it, because there's a lot of debate within the kind of magical community around that. Is it, are these things real as an external, as external entities, or is it only an aspect of your psyche? And I, I like that Lon Milo Duquette quote where he says, it's all in your head, but you don't know how big Bigger. your head is. Yeah. yeah it, <laughs> And it's, it's like that, because I do believe that fundamentally it's just consciousness, but these things do exist as aspects of consciousness, emergent phenomenon of consciousness that arise that we can perceive as tangible external things. And there's a lot of recorded, you know, accounts of that for like 
thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Like basically as long as human beings have existed, there have been depictions of them in art or at least um, tales of these kinds of spirits and things like that. And it's generally been accepted as just an aspect of the human experience for, for millennia. Yeah, I mean, like, like you know, you, you if you want to entertain the idea, you know, of Akashic records, you know, the fact that you know there is like a repository of the entirety of the human experience. Yeah, absolutely right. And I mean, I I agree with Lon there when he says like, you know, it's all in your head. You don't know how uh, how big your head is. What I feel is that over the last, I mean, um, I've been observing a culture since, I mean, I grew up, I'm 42 right now. I start to start doubling with magic when I was 12. So it's been a while, you know, I received my first initiation when I was 18. So it's been, it's been a long process. And what I notice is that lots of people that grow up with magic, you know, especially um, coming from what we call chaos magic, ended up pretty much like wanting to reduce everything. I mean, chaos magic was very reductionist. That's why it worked, right? Because, you know, you would get very complex ideas or even things that had a lot of, you know, a lot of cherries on top, if you want, you know, coming from the Victorian era. And then, you know, let's strip all away and let's go to the tech, like the, what works, well, how, how, how does this work? And that's fantastic. But overall, I feel like we kind of need to go back to appreciate the aesthetics and appreciate the the context of certain um, magical not only practices but also magical exchanges because if you strip everything away then you you end up thinking okay you know my head is actually small i'm just like this shell that's my brain <laughs> and so everything is just in my brain and i feel like it's almost like going backwards <laughs> pretty much like so okay we we we, we entertain the idea that this, everything is so big but then no everything that exists is just this this mortal coils uh, I, I don't think so <laughs> um i don't i don't i even don't like it you know it's not that i don't think so i just don't like it i want i want to entertain the idea that there's so much more than this i mean like you said like thousands and thousands of, of years of either recorded history, you know, in the in you know, in the physical world and maybe also in somewhere else, uh, tells us that it's not the case. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that chaos magic it's very functional and very utilitarian and very results oriented, which I appreciate. And it makes it it makes it really easy to apply to your life yeah. if you are trying to get a certain result out of it. But I think that magic is also theurgy and i think that it's it's also a continuation of a very ancient uh, sacred tradition mm -hmm. and it, it should also fill the soul with that like it should also help people find the sacred and things like that which i find chaos magic sort of lacks in a certain sense yeah. you know a lot of a lot of um a lot of like Crowley's system of magic and Thelema, it's very revelatory and it's, it's, it really upholds the, the sacred component of things. You know, most of the rituals are in place are, are to try to unify your consciousness with something greater than yourself. Yeah. I mean, you know what, like when you look at how Chaos, Chaos Magic came out, I mean, Chaos Magic comes out pretty much in, you know, here in the British Isle in the England as, um, you know, as, as a working class, pretty much reaction to, to the Victorian revival of magic, which was very, very high class. I mean, uh, if you never, if you never been, if you never lived in the UK, of course I'm Italian, but I've been living here for like almost 10 years now. So I, I became enmeshed with the culture here. You don't know how much, you know, uh, people that were making uh, the Victorian revival of magic, they were really not working class, but it's not just like, the, you know, they were conservatives or they were rich people. It's almost like here in the UK, we're really, really living in a caste system. And those people think of themselves like so removed from, you know, us, the little people that uh, that kind of, you know, created this reaction at some point, you know, from the working class, even from the middle class and say, hey, you know what, we're going to reappropriate the tech because magic is the birthright of humanity. The law is for all. That's what Crowley said. And that's why Crowley, despite coming from this very privileged class, he had a lot of glimpses of, okay, how things I feel like really are. The downside of it is that, you no, know, this reappropriation uh, kind of stripped away the theurgy bits, as you mentioned, like, okay, let's just, let's just, let's just focus on sorcery. Let's just focus on something that works. How do I, how do I get better? How do I, uh, how can I get a better job or how can I just survive in a very, you know, a very harsh society and ever, which is, I guess at this point is everywhere in the world, really. Um, but the reality there is that 
you you, you got to strike a balance. You got to strike a balance between the high and the low. And I say high and low, not in um, uh, not saying that one is better than the other, but one 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 you know one works horizontally. One works in order to obtain something that will pretty much like makes you live better. I feel so that you can actually start striving for you know going somewhere else, extending yourself somewhere else. Um, I really don't do magic of results anymore. Uh, I used to do a lot of it <laughs> growing up. I guess that's uh, that's that's something you need to. You also need to prove it works at first. Like, hey, I mean, am I just losing my mind here? Am I just like wasting my time? And then you say, okay, no, that works. I got that job, or you know, th that girl likes me more now. <laughs> you know, things which is something you know you do when I mean I did when I was like a teenager. But what I do right now, it's pretty much only theurgy. It's only like, you know, like working, you know, with, a, with the concept of Holy Guardian Angel, striving towards the idea of crossing the abyss, which are, you know, those two fundamental steps into, I would say, into telemic initiation, and this, no matter which, which order or which system, or which map of reality you adhere to. It's also the, those two steps that I feel that have been discussed so much which is good, but also being like misconstrued so much because you you then go online, which and um, you know you see like, everybody's crossed the abyss now. Once once upon a time, everybody had, had the knowledge and conversation with Guardian Angel just by starting. Now everybody has crossed the abyss. I'm like, okay, um, well, that's that's an interesting perspective. But I feel it's good that people are talking about it. I feel it's I feel like you know for the for the betterment of humanity, which is what magic should do. Uh, it's better that people at least entertain these ideas than just say, "Hey, I want to win the lot. I want to win the lottery, right?" <laughs> it's, which you know it could be good because, but but it's also it's also something that ends up and dries up very fast. I think having experiences of magic working for practical means it can introduce people to the idea of the existence of some kind of other that can be. You know, that can open the door then for people to become more interested in the spiritual aspects of magic. You know, and something I was I was wanting to ask you is I feel like there's a greater disconnect now with the average person and the sacred than there's really ever been. And there's this great thirst for that. And I find that Thelema and magic, it's a bit obscure, you know, it's it it tends to really only sit within a subculture of people. Do you think that magic can help the greater populace in mass discover the sacred and help them unify with with the spiritual that people are longing for i think without doubt and i i mean i also still want to believe that telema specifically uh with its lessons uh, I, as you find them in the holy books of Telema, I would say not so much in whatever else Crowley has written. Crowley wrote everything and the opposite of everything. And I think uh, we need a much more, uh, a better comb, you know, to go through all the writings and find the, the gold nuggets from something maybe could be disregarded. I still want to believe that Telema is, um, you know, the key to um, enable that that spiritual renaissance and that if, even if you want to say the term religious renaissance that I feel humanity needs. I also feel that we've done a terrible job at doing that so far. I feel that, you know, and I, if you read if you read my articles online, like, you know, that I'm very critical of the OTO. I've been a member of OTO and now and, and now I am pretty much one of the most vocal dissenters, if you want. The OTO was entrusted really we try and figure out how to uh, entice the masses to this higher work right uh, and Crowley uh, devised it at first with a Masonic structure because when he was living Freemasonry was very pervasive and very um, like he has a big much bigger appeal than it than he does right now the problem is that those who you know pretty much bought into the legacy, and by that I mean they they really paid the copyrights. That's how they they were able to say, "Hey, we're the real ones." That's and that's maybe something to think about it as well. Uh, they they really haven't done much in the last uh, thirty five years, thirty and forty years almost, and so we are we are at a big disconnect right now where y you have this opportunity. To, to teach the wider population how to feel better. <laughs> that's, that's what magic does, right? What magic really does is that like how, it teaches how to you to get deeper with your, to knowing yourself. And by self, I mean, you know, capital S, who you really are. But it, 
those who were those who actually you know um, were supposed to lead by example they haven't i also feel that maybe we don't need them anymore maybe we don't need maybe we don't need any um any monolithic structure any big school of mysteries anymore because um you know with the age of information like it or not with all the problems that are that are tied to it everybody who's willing to can find the information out like you know when you look at the secrets of the OTO, the secrets of DAA, I would say as well, they've all been printed and they've been printed since the 70s. <laughs> like it's not even something that just happened. They're all out there. They need they need deciphering. I mean, it's something that if you if you, if somebody picks up, I don't know, the Arte Magica, maybe looks and it's like, what what is this? <laughs> but it can be deciphered if if it is your will to go deep. Uh, and uh, and there's plenty of resources out resources outside. I mean, you are a resource. Damien Eggles is a resource. Uh, plenty of people out there speaking about magic and doing it in a open, uh, let's say, in a much much more accessible way. Uh, once again, there's a balance to strike because something that I notice is that by making everything so accessible, you do find a lot of laziness. Like, you know, like I was saying before, people like read, maybe, I don't know, follow whatever people like you, Diamond, even me and many others are doing and, and then say, okay, this is easy. Um, that's all that there is. Uh, I am already, I'm already a master. Right. That's a, that's a laziness that I feel it's, you know, if if there's like an, an agnostic archontic power at, at play, it's the, the you know the Coron zone of dilemma, the dispersion that 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 you know creates an unfocused wheel and scatters the uh, you know the intent towards uh, evolution, spiritual evolution. That's it. You know this this idea that oh okay everything that there's no secrets anymore, so everything must be easy. So I'm already there. No, you must you must still get there, and it's not uh, it's not e it's not easy, and it's not this is not fast, you know. Like, and when I wanted to say also, it's not cheap in the sense that you have to invest a lot of your energy, not money, and you know, you, it's not like you pay the best course and you got it. I mean, this this should be obvious, right? Um, but you have to invest a lot of yourself. Um, something I teach to my students is that, like, in an ideal world, if you if you were to start from zero. And you put six months of daily practice like a monk, like, you know, the Abramelian operation, which kind of asks you to become a monk away from the world for six months, doing only that. You will achieve knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel. But that's the start. That's not the end. <laughs> you know, knowing, the, the, having the union with the angel, knowing your true will, knowing your purpose in life. It's not the start, it's the end. <laughs> Sorry, it's not the end. I mean, I've got to mix it here. It's not the end. <laughs> That's Korans on a play. It's, you know, it's, it's, not the, it's not the end of the goal, it's the start. The, the real next bit will be, you know, this other big concept of crossing the abyss, which, it, which I, th I feel it takes, it takes a lifetime. Um, so again, that's why people need to understand, yes, magic will, will give you the keys to live better. And everybody should should engage with magic at, at you know at their own pace, but without the uh, you know almost like the anxiety of say, of you know applying a badge immediately. You know, I never speak about my AA grade. I never say what OTO degree I was uh, or I still am. It doesn't because it doesn't matter. It feels like there's a, there's always like this obsession. It's like okay, I need to belong somewhere and I need to show the membership card. It's a, it's not about that. It's about are, are you feeling better? Are you coping with with living in some of the worst times of mm, humans' mind, humans' memory? At least for us in the West, right? Um, of course, uh, like we've been, we 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 live in an incredibly privileged society, and we haven't seen real war and real strife in, on you know here on our grounds since you know, World War Two. So it's been what many many years, like. And, and and now we're starting to see something that it's jarring. Uh, I mean, not just COVID, but you know, recession. Recession's been going since two thousand eight. Like, <laughs> I remember in two thousand seven, I was still a musician and still thinking, ah, the world is easy. And then then things went kind of down ever since. But does magic help? Yes, um, if you stick with it <laughs> and if you decide that that's going to be your your life path, because again, it's it is the birthright of humanity. Every single one of us. It's meant to be to to transcend humanity. It's meant to remember that we are bigger than this. It's a long path, though. <laughs> well, it's a devotional path. 
Absolutely. And it's, it's a path that requires a lot of discipline, you know, which is ironic given that do it thou wilt is at the core of the Lima, but it doesn't mean do whatever you want. <laughs> it, it requires also a lot of discipline, and I think in a lot of work. And I think that's something that even deters people from getting into, you know, magic yeah. or ceremonial magic as they look at these books and they try to read them and they're just like, this is too much. I can't handle this, you know, which also makes it re more rewarding in a way because there's with greater challenge, there's greater reward, greater I think, reward, from, right. you know, that the text isn't that accessible. It actually requires contemplation to understand it and things yeah. like that. That makes the, that makes the path, at least for me, more rewarding. It is more rewarding if if you if you're willing to engage with it. But, and but also, as I was saying before, we live in a world where um, if if you if it is your will to go down this path and if it is your will to know who you truly are and then go from there like i said there's so many more uh tools right now on top of the book like um you can engage with 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 the courses you can engage with the teachings teachers that can actually you know do what what i always what I always felt like was really happening in the golden dawn you know in an isis urania temple because if you read the reports that was like these people were really engaging with it but they had like you know face-to-face -face teachers like they could ask questions what has been missing in the intervening times, I would say, let's say from the 60s onwards, when, you know, ceremonial magic was rediscovered, really, and Telema was rediscovered, really, what we've been missing is that then we only had the books, because almost like we, we lost almost two generations of teachers, right? And people had to really find their ways, as you say, like reading the books and then getting a much higher reward and say, okay, no, I, I did unlock this. Uh, just to give you an idea, when I started, uh, I mean, I was in Italy, in Rome. I I did I did read English already because I um, I was living in the States in, as a child, thanks to my father's job. But we had no book, no English books in Italy, and the uh, only thing we had was a bad translation of the 1972 edition of Magic, um, edited by Grant and Simon. So that that edition itself is already like there's bits missing, right? Uh, the, the Italian translation had chunks missing because the translator could not understand it, so it just didn't translate. So you know, you know that, that's how that was like my first approach to dilemma. I was like, okay, I need to I need to make sense of this. But I feel like w the original plan was to in fact have uh, I don't know almost like a, a teaching system, like you know, uh, people you could go and ask. Um, and now I feel like we're getting back to that. So. It's definitely true that people should apply themselves to with the utmost, you know, focus to to let's say distill. This is really an alchemical process, right? You know, you have you go through the Negredo, the Albedo, and the Rubedo phases in this. Like you really have you have to distill yourself. Think of yourself as an alchemical Athanor while you're still burning and churning this thing inside you. But then you can also go outside and ask people, you know, because there's been people that have been doing this work. And I feel like we are we are recreating like a generation, or maybe even two now. I think of I think of Lon Duquette. Yeah, definitely that, that he could be my dad. So yeah, let's say two generations of of, of people that have been doing that. You can go and ask. Again, the downside it's always that you know, in, in since we live in a dual in dual in duality, and we are so stupid into polarity all the time. The 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 flip side of this coin is that there's also so much more disinformation. So again, once again, it becomes an alchemical process of distillation in this case. Like you have to, you have to see, okay, well, is this good information? Is this bad? Should I listen to this person? <laughs> Should I not listen to this person? It's, it's complex, you know, but complexity, it's what makes rewarding. So I definitely agree mm -hmm. there with you. Sure. And I mean, discernment of information is just a skill that one needs to have in the age that we live in anyway, for everything, not just for <laughs> magic. And I think people have different degrees of that and they're going to you know, attract different qualities of teachers as a result. But I was curious, so you've been involved in the OTO and also the AA, so you've done a lot of these actual, the initiatic work of these organi organizations, but do you consider that to be necessary? And I'm curious about what your vision is moving into the future. Do you see these things going more online, kind of uh, through digital mentorship? Um, this is a very good question, and it's actually something I'm still trying to fully um, decode and unlock myself. 
I can tell you that uh, you don't need any order to initiate you. What you get from them is a formal, formal recognition of a work you, you have done yourself. Uh, this is true for magical orders. That I'm talking about the AA in this case. The, re the, re the reason why the grades of the AA are called grades, it's because you get graded. <laughs> like, you know, like, have you done the work? This is your grade. Like, this is like, instead of like A plus, you get, I don't know, Zelator, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the work you do is with yourself. In the AA itself also, like when it comes to um, rituals of initiation, there's only two and they're only the, the first two. Everything else has always been doing like, have you done the work? There's tasks to be done. Did you pass the task? Then you can claim that grade. It's a very useful map of reality to understand pretty much like oh, understand yourself with yourself really where you're at and where you should go but do you need the AA to to certify uh, your accomplishment i don't think so because true true initiation comes from the holy guardian angel and once you have that the connection with the holy guardian angel knowledge and conversation to use the proper term then there's a fr let's a free flow of new teachings of new tasks that that comes constantly right it that is the the point that is why uh, you know every man and every woman is a star the star is the angel the star is you know going deeper the star is a hadith that tries to you know to aspire to go back to new and that that is the interplay of cosmos that is the, the, how everything works pretty much now when it comes to the OTO it's a very different discussion because the OTO is not magical, it's Masonic. And that's something most people don't know, especially because since 1985 and since, you know, Greg McMurtry and then Bill Breeze and, and what the OTO you can join today, and I'm going to say something, I'm going on record, I did it many times, it's a cosplay group. There's nothing else. It's a, it's a society of, of it's a very small, very um, scattered uh, society of people that gather together just to discuss dilemma, just to enact rituals that most of the times they just go off script by reading because they never studied, they never integrated. They also don't, most of these people don't know nor like Freemasonry, uh, so they don't understand how, how much different that system is from a, from a magical system like the AA. And that's why the various steps of OTO are called degrees and not grades, because the reality there is that in a Masonic system, you are presented with a truth, a specific magical formula. And slowly by slowly, by degrees, like going around a circle, this formula is unveiled to you. But none of this is clear to those who run, you know, lodges these days. Um, there's no strict curriculum. There's no strict syllabus. Everybody does a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, you get um, these bits where, you know, like after you know, the first degree, for instance, you get um, a study pack, which is a few pages, and tells you to, to start performing the Star Ruby. Now, the Star Ruby, Liber 25, is a very advanced uh, AA ritual, which is something that, in fact, you know, it implies that it should really, it's really it's like the domain, the, the, the domain of the Adeptus Maior. Uh, not something you should be given to, you know, neophytes or, you know, people that start. But why do they do that? Because, because they don't know any better. So in that case, you know, to answer the question, do we need the OTO? No, <laughs> we, we, there's, there's nothing coming from the OTO. What it offers is a sense of community which is great. It's very important. You, we are social creatures, like we need community. I mean, the last year of us in lockdowns pretty much proved that. But the, the flip side, as I wrote in my articles, is that then it enables a lot of terrible, terrible behavior. I mean, I, I have seen rape enabling, rape silencing, uh, speaking of, you know, I never see it directly, but I know in the States there have been cases of murder. There's been connections with, you know, the alt-right, connections with people that, you know, some of the people that were, you know, assaulting uh, the, the U.S. Capitol last week, um, they had connections with people in the ODO. They still do. Oh. I mean, it, it becomes it, it, like it's because again, if you don't have a strong leadership with a clear vision and with a will to, you know, to set boundaries, because all that dilemma is became pretty much like a an American rugged libertarian philosophy, which is not, by the way, it's it it has parts of it, but it's not all that there is. 
then everything goes and you know over the floodgates right so do we need any of anything like that no we don't down there where are we going next um hmm I, I don't I don't have the answer yet. I mean, I feel that everything online doesn't work. Um, last year, two years ago, I started this community myself uh, and it grew to have like over 120 people right now. So it's 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 bigger than 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 I don't know, the, the biggest lodge of audio three times over. Right. But it's clear that at some point people will want to meet in a real person, like in real life. People will want that connection. And there are some specific magical operations that you do in a circle. You do when, when you can, you know, tap onto the energy and to the prana of more practitioners working together. So I feel that going forward, we will have to find a way to strike again a balance between the experience that we gathered in the last year or so of the online, let's say the online experience, uh, the podcast, the, the, the YouTube videos, the the zoom webinars and everything that plot with you know meeting in person maybe every, every every three months maybe you know something like you know following the wheel of the year if that's your thing um or something akin to that right like a, a, a mix of both i also think that the moment like virtual reality comes into play whenever it will yeah that's it that's game over <laughs> like we will all get there because think about it like and i, I, I mean i i think you already thought about it very well it's just that once you really unlock a full virtual reality experience you can meet with people from all over the world while having the the experience of you know um a gathering a in-person gathering i really believe that that's the that it, that will be the future um it might come much, much faster than we expect. Or, it, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist myself, and I don't like to make this kind of, pre, um, um, you know, pre, um, what is it? Pre precognitions, because I was I was one of those who did not buy Bitcoin back in the day. So, you know, that's, I'm definitely not good at that. But um, I feel like the moment that that is fully unlocked, then that, that's it. That, 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 that's where we will go. Um, I mean, there's been, I think it's Scott Wilde in the United States, uh, somebody already created almost, I mean, it's very rough, but created like the first, um, the first degree initiation, uh, like this, like the, the Zelatar initiation of Golden Dawn as a virtual, that. have you seen that, right? I it, saw it on YouTube. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's like, it, it's rough, but it's, it, it tells you where you can go, especially because another thing it, it has to be said that. When it comes to uh, group initiations, when it comes, you know, to this like Masonic style initiations or anything ceremonial, I feel that it's not good enough to just, you know, get a paper ring or a cheap robe. I've done both. I've done, you know, the, the, the cheap way to do that. And I've done the very, very you know, bombastic way of doing that. And, and you are so much more, your senses are so much more like stimulated when you are in, a, in an incredibly, you know, beautiful temple than if you are in a community center in South of London, where somebody is actually, you know, knocking on the door because they think it's the toilet. It's just not the same, you know. Uh, yeah, that happened in many ways uh, in Amateur Lodge. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wrote something about it. It's, um, yeah, it's fun, fun times. <laughs> but like I said, like, if you, if you want to go ceremonial, it must be, it must be ceremonial. C ceremonial magic implies that what you're trying to do really is like you're trying to bombard your senses, uh, your, your sight, your smell, uh, your, your hearing, uh, your taste in certain points, certain point, with things that will like almost like force your body of light to start, you know, reverberating and start vibrating at higher uh, higher frequency. Uh, that's that's the promise of virtual reality. I feel, you know. Mm. So yeah, I've I've absolutely thought about that, and I have friends here who develop virtual reality content, and I've I've talked with them about those ideas too, and they're a bit on the magical bent. I used to own the HTC Vive and have all the VR equipment. And mm -hmm. there's a program in there. It's called uh, Tilt Brush that lets you like draw around yourself in this kind of empty space. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be just perfect to do magical ritual in because you could do like the lesser I mean, banishing ritual and actually draw the pentagrams to where you can see it and stuff. And it, that would be such a cool experience to try it. My, my point is that also uh, I wonder if like 
because they're one of the bits of you know doing the, the pentagrams and the hexagram rituals everything you know what i consider um neophyte level um I mean, pentagrams, hexagrams, it's not really under the fight level, but let's say uh, and entry level rituals is also like to force you to teach you to visualize. And, you know, like the idea right. that you really want to get to into the Rana state, you really want to get in a point where you are able to close your eyes and create a universe around you. So I would say, like, is this going to enable laziness as well? Because I say, OK, well, I see it because I see it like uh, but it could be it could be a, it could be a staging ground. It could be it could be something where you say like uh, we're starting from here, so at least you know you can see what you should visualize, and then the next bit is like you detach from virtual reality and you create your own virtual reality. Because I mean, when you access whatever we call like the astral plane, which is a theosophical concept, of, we, the, the sooner we leave it behind, the bet the better I feel. But when you access, let's say, like a lunar body uh, a perception. Uh, a yesodic perception, uh, then that that that's 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 akin to virtual reality. I mean, when you when you're able to um, uh, you know create a, a lucid dream experience at will, that is virtual reality because your 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 consciousness is there, but you create the world around you. So I feel like virtual reality could really get to the point where okay, this is how we teach magic. Like this is how we this is how we get people together in. Um, in a much more entertaining way than a Zoom call can be, uh, but at some point we get we plug them out and say, okay, now you got to do what you've seen. You got to do it on your own, which is <laughs> right. No, I agree. I understand what you're saying. I just think it could be cool, and it could also be used to stage particular rituals like invocations and things like that, where you can create an environment and virtual reality that many people don't have the actual. They don't have the ability to make that in their house like maybe they don't have a temple space that they can use but you could be totally immersed in a particular environment to do a ritual in in vr and it could be great also to you know to study uh the history of magic like i mean i when i was living in london and i mean i still go to london for for work and for freemasonry like i have in london as a, as a london freemason and london, a member of, of other you know london uh, orders let's say all the ionic orders i get uh, the opportunity to walk into Freemason's Hall, to be in the Grand Temple there, to walk into Duke Street, which is where, you know, uh, a lot of like golden don't happen. It, you need that, you need that kind of like, you need those you know, you know, marble pillars, you need those mosaics, you need the, you need that to really see, oh, okay, this is what they were writing. This is what, you know, William Butler Yeats or even, even Crowley speaks about. Um, that you know the, the promise of virtual reality is to give that experience to everyone um mm. also maybe you know killing real estate prices in the, in the, in the time which should be good <laughs> so. totally well i wanted to back it up a little bit because not everybody that listens to my podcast is so familiar with dilemma or so familiar with magic and i was hoping that you could give a little bit of an overview just what exactly is Thelema. i think a lot of people have heard of alistair crowley and have you know various associations about him maybe some fearful thoughts about him as a as a person and as a character um, but probably not too many people have ever really even heard the word Thelema. of course um Thelema, first of all, it, I mean, it's a Greek word. Let's go to the very basics. It means will. There are two fundamental concepts in this religion, philosophy of magic, um, can be can be described as both, and it already gives the idea that it's a much more multi-layer um, you know, practice than it seems at first. And that those two fundamental concepts, again, it's dilemma, will, and agape, love. Uh, so we already started looking at the idea that we have a religious philosophy of magic focused on the concepts of will and love. There's a third concept that's very important in Telema, and the fact that, as I mentioned before, every man and every woman is a star, implying once again that in this, in this tradition, uh, everyone has the, the chance to prove to themselves that they are much more than just humans, that they're just much, much more than the masks they don every day, much more than the jobs they do, much more than their, their, you know, their hopes, their melancholia, their anxieties, everything like that. They are stars. And by stars, we mean gods, really. What we perceive as humans, gods. So in a nutshell, Telema is... 
Elon offers you a big promise. <laughs> it tells you, uh, follow these practices and try to really focus your will by virtue of loving the universe all. And by doing that, you will find your way to your true self, which is divine. Um, I'm not sure if this actually <laughs> really answers your questions or creates more questions, but this is what I like. To, I, this, is, this is what Telema is for me. Uh, something that I've been, it, could, it resonated with me from the very beginning when I first, when I first heard of Crowley. And uh, immediately after I realized that in order to fully make sense of the teachings of Telema, which as I said, what we said before, right now, I had to pretty much leave Crowley behind <laughs> because I totally empathize with the many, 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 many who, you know, find find maybe the Book of the Law or even maybe find, I don't know, Liber Sadi or Liber Arita, which are very beautiful poetry uh, pieces. But then they realize, oh, Crowley wrote them and Crowley was a terrible human being. Yes, he was. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like it, for Telema to really establish itself, we need... We need to get get rid of Crowley strong. We need to move past Crowley. Um, we have to accept that when we speak of Aleister Crowley, we need, you know that this term like boomer, right? Like everybody's mm. a boomer. Crowley was a boomer four times over. <laughs> I mean, imagine that. Imagine like wanting to try and make sense of what a very flawed man did who died in 1947 did you know in the late victorian and edwardian periods it's it's impossible like uh, you can't do that uh, but telema is not crowley telema is much bigger than crowley telema can be uh, understood and can be um filtered outside the crowley prism you know uh, what i'm working right now and it's gonna take me maybe a few more weeks I'm working on a post dilemma manifesto, uh, and it's something that I want to, I want to put out maybe around spring. There's been a huge push in the last few years um, to try and send out the message that yes, Crowley was a terrible human being. Yes, Crowley's actions and often words did enable a lot of this uh, terrible uh, alt-right uh, neo-fascism that you find in a culture, especially gravitating around Telema. But it's also true that that's not all that there is. And if the way forward is to just say, you know what, Telema served its purpose, uh, now, now, now it's time to, to live in a post telemic environment, which means we still accept the Book of the Law, with even with chapter three, which sounds very <laughs> jarring to many, uh, we still uh, uh, we still accept the you know the, the teachings and the tantras because those are tantras of the holy books. Um, we still accept the fact that Crowley, the man, has uh, you know embodied at some point the, the concept of the prophet of Telema and Kafna Konsu. But we are moving past Crowley, and we're trying to make sense. We're trying to keep the good. <laughs> and get rid of the of you know what I perceive to be the bad and what a lot of commentary commentators have perceived to be the bad. I don't, I'm not sure it's going to be successful. Uh, we'll try <laughs> because I feel that that's the way where people will will read will be able to engage with all the good that is found in Telema without having to worry of am I am I am I, am I following a fascist am I following a, a rapist all things that Crowley you could argue it was. I mean, a rapist, he definitely raped Victor Neuberg because when we, when we speak of rapists, we often think of Crowley, you know, raping women, which may have happened as well, but we know as a fact that he did rape with Victor Neuberg plenty of times. So do I want that as my prophet? I don't. <laughs> you know, I personally don't. But is Telema that? No, I don't think it's, it's that. There's, I mean, it's, there's beauty in Telema. There's life, light, love, and liberty in the law of the mm -hmm. That's what we need, I feel. I mean, like you said before, like that is the theory. That is like the those lessons that we can apply and we can use in order to better ourselves, in order to grow bigger than we are, which I'm going to repeat myself. It is the birthright of humanity. That's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Right. Yeah. And I also try as best as possible to, to look at the art and try to remove the 
person who made the art, you know, behind it. Because Crowley had some truly inspired moments in the work that he created, you know, and there's been a lot of other, I, I consider Crowley an artist, and there's been a lot of other artists throughout history, like Caravaggio murdered people and, you know, Picasso was a horrible narcissist, misogynist, but they both had in, incredibly inspired moments and they, they, they contributed a lot of light to humanity as well. And there's times when I read what Crowley wrote and it's, it's really inspiring and it's really beautiful and it's profound. And so even though he was who he was, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of heinous things um, said about him, some of which are perhaps true, some of which are perhaps not, uh, he still had inspired moments as a writer. And I still think that his ideas and concepts were great contributions to understanding humanity's place in the cosmos, et cetera. I'm absolutely with you. And I want to make it clear. I, I don't like cancel culture. <laughs> I don't want to cancel Crowley. I have, I have ever found, you know, especially in my, um, in my experience with what I call mainstream organized dilemma, that is OTO, that it it's so so easy it becomes Crowley worship and nothing else. So easy it becomes, you know, people not doing their will anymore, but trying to emulate the will of Crowley. And that's not dilemma. <laughs> that is that is not it. Uh, so Possibly, I feel like I'm, we're getting to a point where maybe people like me and, uh, and other other voices might have to. I don't want to say take a stance because again, this is not about canceling Crowley. This, and I hate cancel culture. I'm going to say it again. Uh, you know, keeping people accountable, yes. Canceling people just because one day you decide, uh, no, fuck you, no, that's not good. But that's why I think that maybe it's time to say, okay, if 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 there, if there's a subset of telemites, if there's a subset of occultists that are so hell bent of th saying telema is Crowley, telema is Crowley, telema is Crowley, then we create post dilemma and we take the good of Crowley, and then we say to these people, you cannot call us fascist because you think Crowley was a fascist because we reject that. You know, we reject right. that in magic, magic without tears, he calls Krishnamurti uh, an word messiah. We reject that. But do we reject uh, the depths of poetry of that, that, that you mentioned? No. Do we reject his, his very good insights of magic? No. Do we reject the fact that through his seership, we received, you know, the, I feel like we, we uh, channeled and properly reified onto this reality Babylon, which, you know, it's to me the focus of Telema. No, we don't. <laughs> we actually celebrate that. And th thank you, thank you, Lester Crowley, for doing that. But that's where I feel like, you know, possibly living behind Crowley means it's almost like enthroning the Mastertarian, enthroning the Magus, not the man. <laughs> like, right. Like, well, yeah. I feel like they're almost they're almost like different entities. Yeah, it's like there was Alistair Crowley, and then there is the Master Theory, and they're almost like two separate beings entirely. Like that, right. this other thing would come through him that wasn't him, you yeah. know. And I mean, if you look at psychics or people that are more sensitive to these types of experiences, they often have a lot of dysfunction in their personality. You know, Edward Kelly is a is another example of somebody who, who struggled a lot with kind of just being a, a person, but was obviously a gifted visionary and psychic and medium, you know? So yeah, you know, Crowley was, was extremely traumatized as a person and never did his shadow integration work, I guess yeah, you would say exactly. now <laughs> in, in like in new age terms. Well, it's a new age term, but it works. You, you, understand, you, you, you nailed it there, right? It's, it's definitely, there's definitely a lot of that. And, uh, but like, like you said, like, when you truly engage with, with, with the text, I mean, he makes no, um, no secret that, you know, Frater Perdurabo is a part of him. You know, Ume is a part of him. VVVVV is a part of him. Um, the Master Therion is the part of him like what we should actually pay attention to um do we need to read the confessions maybe not do we read to need the holy books absolutely yes do we need to read magic interior practice uh yes absolutely you know do we need to, do we need to read magic without tears i love it there's i would do an edition of it right? i would say i would keep things here and out but um, maybe it would be a bit too much but that's the thing is like, let's listen, let's listen to the master 
you know, no, let's not listen to the man. And uh, unfortunately, I can I have to I have to say it once more. What my experience in OTO, which is again, you know, what is considered you know mainstream dilemma, the dilemma that people know as easy as easier as possible immediately see most people there they 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 don't care about finding their wills they they want to make daddy Crowley happy and that's that's as old ionic as it gets you know it's like it's as far as possible and that's like a shortcoming just of humanity right and Crowley really emphasized finding your own will which means being discerning and having your own opinions and not just blindly following people and things like that but but like anything else there's uh, there are people that are not as strong in the in that capacity and they find themselves taken by some other force that they're looking for leaders you yeah. know and i think that something i really enjoy about thelema that empowers me is it, it really rejects the idea of having any leaders outside of yourself you know, and, and to really be empirical about your experience of life, see what works for you and see what doesn't and, and follow that, you know, which is, which is incredible. You know, not a lot of religions or, or spiritual systems make that suggestion. And, and you know what, you, you got to tell me if you want me to spill some secrets. So if you tell me now, if you want, if you want not to, or if not, I'm going to tell you something secret I, about the OTO. I, I, I'm, I would love to hear some secrets. <laughs> So, I'm sure our listeners would love to hear some secrets too. What is really interesting about what you mentioned is that, like I said, like usually this, this approach of uh, mainstream telemites about, you know, wanting to appeal to Crowley's words, wanting to see him as, you know, the prophet, never swaying from what he said, those are usually OTO members, right? But usually OTO members almost never finish, not even like the first set of initiation. The first set of initiations is the maneuver triad. Triad would imply three degrees, but in fact, there's three more subset degrees. So in fact, there's six initiations, right? And what's interesting in this series of six initiation is that at the end of them, after you, when you become a perfect initiate or Prince of Jerusalem, you you go on through a way well. You start as a as a Minerva. You start as a prisoner in the camp of Saladin, and then when you become like you know um, right before perfect initiate, four degree OTO, you you are like exalted. You are brought in and like almost like you went from zero to here, right? And this is this also and you've done that because you followed Crowley. You followed the master's words. Now the final initiation, a very very few people get to. It's like you get stripped of everything and you're tossed in front of Babylon, and Babylon tells you nothing of this matter. You must think for yourself. Now, <laughs> when you look at the idea, this is how I say, like, you know, those are degrees, right? Like, those are, you, you slowly go through the experience. What's always find fascinating to me is that all these people that say online, we, we must be Crowleyite, we must follow the master. They never, they never went through that, or they never even understood that. Because literally, like, that's one of the most profound bits in the system of OTO. Everything else that comes after, Crow even says in Liber 194, is that after the Man of Earth triad, uh, all the degrees that go you know, from KW, Knights of the East and West, till 9 degree, those are um, iteration of the second degree because they are iteration on life. But the real initiatic experience, the real, uh, the real ma- telemic message come in the, in the first triad which everybody should go through, but very few do, because <laughs> very few maybe want to understand that there are no gods, there are no masters, there's only you and yourself, and you have to fully engage with that in order to become the master of your universe and become a star in harmony with other stars. But unfortunately, people want Daddy Crowley and <laughs> want somebody to tell them, oh, no, you're right. You're doing it right. Yeah, here, here's another badge. Here's another uh, accolade. You're good. You're doing good. You're doing good. It's not, not Dilemma. Dilemma yeah, is, uh, is beyond all of that. <laughs> well, that's, that's like a Band-Aid for just the existential angst of being alive, you know, and a lot of people don't want to reconcile with that. It's easier to just think, okay, well, I just believe this now, but that's just the way it is. I don't know. <laughs> it, it just becomes another religion, which it is, is, which it is, is ironic. Yeah, yep. it is another religion. And I'll tell you, I mean, I'll be honest, like Crowley did engage many times with the idea of, you know, Telema is a religion. 
in Magic in uh, Magic Without Tears, which is along with the Book of Thought, the last things he wrote. It, there's this letter where he says, like, call it a religion if you must, but I think it's bullshit. <laughs> I'm, I'm not quoting verbatim, but that's the idea. What the modern OTO did, um, you know, registered as a tax exempt religion and tried to become a mega church. I feel there's a there's a bit of a problem there, you know. And I say that as somebody who's actually you know running Ecclesia Gnostica Universalis, uh, being a bishop, um, I love the religious element. But like the Masonic element, those are almost like stage plays to go to deeper mysteries. Nobody wants to do. Nobody wants to really go into the nitty gritty of magical practices from the start. Um, Somebody wants to go by step. The Masonic, the Masonic, and the religious, uh, let's say, like uh, tracks offer that, and that's fine. But don't all make it only that. If you make it only a religion, or if you make it only a Masonic fraternity, uh, you're missing the message of Babylon, which tells you none of this matter. I am beyond all of this, and you must come to me. <laughs> so you know that's. Uh, which is, if you think about it, it's very Zen. It's very, it's very, it, it is the Wu Wei, right? It's like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, something I wanted to ask you just to, to clarify is what does the great work mean to you? Because I've heard different people, they have, they have different ways of understanding this. I think Damien talked about the great work to him means like the, the crystallization of the, the rainbow light body so that the, you're, you're, you can exist beyond death as, as, a, as an entity. I've always kind of perceived the great work relating to the idea of the new aeon and it, and it being about like bringing about um, a certain, like a significant change in reality and in consciousness um, on a collective level. But I'm kind of curious what you think about it and, and what you think uh, it means. I, I feel that the understanding of the great work changes as your, your own initiative, initiation changes. As you get deeper into your own initiation, you will perceive this concept in a different way. It's the same idea of that the more you engage with an alchemical process, the more you go deeper into it, the more you realize it as more strata that you have to, you have to you know, synthesize. And uh, you will have to apply different understanding as you go deeper and deeper. Personally, I am very close to Damien because that's why we we you know, became friends and we agree on a lot of things. Like I really believe the magic, the great work must be first of all embodied in yourself. First of all, you must you know create, um, establish and create these layers. He calls it the rainbow body. I call it the, the the body of light and then the body of glory. All these terms are pretty much the same. Really it depends on which tradition you you encountered first right but let's call it the body of glory or the rainbow body uh you must do that because those are those that is that is the by creating that the great that by great by using that as great work you create a vessel for a better reception of the angel inside you and when i say you i mean marco for now but of course marco is just a vessel that's my understanding of that but by virtue of doing this, by virtue of pretty much, you know, extending your consciousness, by virtue of receiving more of the astral light of the angel, you will, by default, by, by a byproduct, really, you will uh, bring the law of the eon onto the world around you. To the point that one of the tasks of the AA, of course, is that after crossing the abyss, which, as I said before, it's not something I claim. Uh, I don't. I, I, it's not. It's not something I think I've done. Um, by crossing the abyss, you start to tend to your garden. Like you start to, you start to to, to, to ra radiate that light that you've received, and it has been described as well as you know taking the bodhisattva bow. You know, coming. Mm -hmm. You know, leaving leaving. Uh, uh, leaving um, the, the the illusion of duality and then coming back into it in order to teach, in order to radiate the same the same gnosis. Um, it's 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 both things at once. <laughs> that's 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 the way I understand it. And maybe there's even more to that because maybe uh, by virtue and again this is this is a wild idea, but let's entertain it for a second. By virtue of you know 
being somebody who's been you know expanding and, and creating and and crystallizing your body of light which eventually as i said like once you activate it if you want all layers you create a body of glory uh maybe by virtue of doing that you start activating the same in the people around you almost by osmosis mm -hmm. so you know right. like, like this is the idea of you know, bringing light tending to your garden um it's not just uh, you know having followers on on instagram or or on, on twitter or whatnot which sadly it's something somebody told me recently it's like oh but you cannot teach you don't have enough followers like oh god <laughs> like, okay jesus Sorry. only had 12 man <laughs> exactly right <laughs> But anyway, uh, our culture is fun from time to time, but, but it is that like, so the great work becomes all of this working on your, I feel like you must work on yourself first. I feel like, again, since this, since this is alchemy, you must create your alambic, you must create your, your Athanor, you must tend to your fire. Uh, you must become a, um, like a conduit for the fire from heaven. After you've done that, you start pretty much by virtue of osmosis, radiating the light around the world, uh, activating the people around you. Uh, and by, by that, I mean, both people, you know, that you meet in the flesh and people that you meet, you know, across, uh, you know, discord or not. Uh, the message can get lost there a little bit, but you know what I mean? Uh, and then this becomes what you say, this becomes, you know, you know, bringing the law of dilemma um, in the world. The more you the, the more you do that the more you the more you become also especially if you're an artist like i mean you are i'm a musician uh you you almost like you get a better connection with what we call the muse like you get mm -hmm. a better connection and then you get more ideas how okay how how can i stratify this message because not everybody wants to read a book uh not everybody wants to listen to a song not everybody wants to entertain like so you you, you get new ideas on how to reach out um and that is the great work uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I think it's like there's certain people I've met who are spiritual teachers or whatever that when you just get around them, you feel a, a level of openness or, or something just by being in proximity to them. And I would imagine it's the same way with anybody who has ascended to a high degree in magic and completed the great work. And I see a lot of parallels between magic and other spiritual practices. It's just the Western esoteric tradition, but there's the Eastern esoteric tradition and there's the esoteric tradition of South America, of Native America, of a lot of different cultures. And it's, it's similar regardless. And there's different terminology to describe sort of the same thing but you know like what you're describing is similar a lot of buddhist monks at a certain point get kicked out of the monastery because it's like okay now it's your time to go teach like you've you've done your work here your work here is finished now you have to help other people do that work uh it's funny you mentioned that because um in 2000 and what three yeah 2003 i was tra working in italy and trans i translated uh one of kenneth grant books against the light and and then I work on Cults of the Shadows, um, and I remember I was I never met Kenneth Grant in person, but we were we were um, we were discussing like you know via letter at the time, <laughs> and cool. and something he told me it was like because at the time you know I was a member of DA already and been a member of DA since nineteen ninety eight, but I was not a member of OTO. I would become a member of OTO much later, like in 2011, uh, 2012, 2011, 2012. and. Um, I remember I was asking like, so should I join the, should I join, should I join the Tifonian or the Tifonian OTO at the time, because they will become the Tifonian order later. And something that he will, mm -hmm. he will reply is like, like, you will only, only say like the, the OTO is for those who have not discovered their true will. Those who do, they don't need the OTO. <laughs> so, and, and of course, you know, this, this message didn't stick with me because eventually I did join the OTO, which I maybe didn't need, but when I look back at it, it's something that, you know, that that became an experience in itself that pretty much brought me here because uh, before that I was very, very private in my practice. I was not, I, I was, I, my outward persona was a musician. It was not like, you know, um, somebody who works with, with the, who teaches magic or practice magic. I, I was, I, I was very practiced. I've been very practiced since, you know, the nineties. Um, I mean, I would pepper ideas in my songs. I would like use uh, 
some like iconography but i would not i would not say you know i'm outwardly a magician it's it's you know it's the experience of the audio and everything that came out of it made me realize okay now we we need people that say that there's a better way because if not this birthright of humanity gets lost in translation and that's not good but um yeah, mon monks at some point should be kicked out of the monastery because <laughs> the final step of the of, of the great work, or maybe not the final step, let's say well, like one fundamental step of, of the great work is to start reverberating that light. You can only grow further yourself if you find a way to distill what you know, your gnosis, your knowledge for others to drink at it. And it's a very, very, very tricky process because it's so easy to become yet another cult member it's so easy to fall into the trap of ego of egoic traps of oh i have all the truth i know everything i mean like a very old man is like look 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 upon my uh, you know my works and despair not really because you know something that i learned is that it doesn't matter how how, you know, how, how, how deep uh, and important uh, gnostic experience you had at the end of the day, you still have to pay rent or mortgage and you still have to go around in your life and life will swing back and forth because that's the experience of this reality. It's dualistic. We will constant experience happiness and sadness. We will constantly experience you know, elation and desperation. That's that's how it is. As long as we are rooted into this into this body um, and we want to live in society, maybe, you know, maybe getting outside society, maybe, you know, getting into a monastery might be different. Never did it. Uh, but as long as you're rooted here, you you will have to keep this balancing act going, and that's why when you start you also start teaching, it's so easy to say, "Oh, wait a second, I am I am the big master, whatever, and I and I'm owed everything from no no." You must keep a very 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 humble approach to it, um, which is also why I always cringe when people you know, declare, "I'm degree this and this, I'm great this and this." Like, Shut up, man. There's no need for that. Well, I think it's like we've rarefied these states of consciousness, but as these technologies and these practices become more and more available, the states of consciousness are going to be less rarefied, you know? So we've just, and they're not, they're not rarefied in regards to the development of humankind as a whole, because for like thousands and thousands and thousands of years, it was normal for human beings to have spiritual experiences. It's only really in the last few hundred years that they've become it's so rare revolution, maybe if you want to say that like it's been it was yeah tripped pretty much yeah yeah so you get people even i i think even crowley's guilty of this that have these really powerful experiences and then it it, it, it creates another ego trip out of that you know whereas the way i see it we're moving towards a time and i think that this is sort of what the Annapurus is about, where more and more people have access to these rarefied states of consciousness and where more and more people start to have these kinds of experiences, you know? So hopefully as this becomes more and more common, that kind of ego trip that goes with it is gonna become less common. I would hope so. Uh, I also noticed how in the last maybe 10 years or so, um, there's been a lot of like spiritual tourism. Uh, and I mean, about like, when I'm growing well, up, growing... I live in Bali, so I know all about <laughs> spiritual. Tourism. I mean, I live in Glastonbury, right? So you too, yeah. There you understand go. That. The two places. The, the, one of the yeah. If we if we had somebody on Sedona, we would have all the all the bases covered. But no, what I mean is that you know, by spiritual tourism, like not so much people that dabble and leave. That's fine. I, I'm much more worried that it's so easy now to access an ayahuasca ceremony, a peyote ceremony. Um, I am a strong proponent of the idea that this plants, the spirit, like plant allies exist because they are the Amrita, they are the, you know, the nectar of the God that will help us, you know, reach those deeper st status of consciousness that you mentioned, but you got to know them, you got to really understand them because I've seen a lot of people, unfortunately, a lot of people, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about 10 and more right now that maybe went on a ayahuasca ceremony without knowing what they were going to, but just because it's cool. And they had their, they, they had their, their personality shattered after that. You know, that, that's why, you know, in magic, if we, if we follow you know, the Western magic tradition, 
the A, the AA system, whatever you want to call it, right? Like you start by balancing the elements and balancing yeah. the elements, not just, you know, hey, uh, water, air. It's like water is your feelings, fire, your, your passion, your emotion, your think, your thoughts, air. Like you pretty much create a strong foundation and infrastructure for really enabling the fifth element spirit where, you know, when, where, where the real fun starts, right? Where, but most people, and I mean, that's what ayahuasca does. That's what Piyata does. That's what DMT does in many ways. But just, you know, just trusting yourself into it. And I say like, like Joe Rogan, like everything's cool. DMT, the best thing ever. It's like, yeah, bro, but have you done some work before? <laughs> have you been working on yourself before? Because you might be lucky and it might be the best experience of your life, which for most people it is really, but you might be not. You might end up, you know, with your ego shattered. Which is right. not something you want either. Like, like we always hear these things like oh, we need to leave the ego behind. Yeah, cross after you cross the abyss. That's a long way, man. <laughs> like that's a, it's gonna take a long time. You must you, right. you must nurture your ego, you must balance your ego, you must keep your ego in check, but you don't want to destroy it from the beginning. Where are you gonna go without it? How are you gonna survive? Mm -hmm. How are you gonna live in, in the world around you? Right. Yeah, and a lot of it is kind of like excuses in a way uh, for people to not take responsibility for for their lives in, in a lot of ways you know like i mean i live in a in a spiritual community that's that has a lot of spiritual tourists and a lot of people don't have certain aspects of their lives kind of together the elements are not balanced uh, but they see the balancing of the elements of their life which includes like making money and things like that as as egoic and then they just discard it and say like, oh, I don't want anything to do with the material world. And it doesn't really work that way. You need to actually create a firm and stable foundation, like you're saying, that then you can spiritually mature upon, but without that foundation, you can't really get there. And in regards to, to ayahuasca, I mean, I've been to Peru and I've drinking ayahuasca in the, in the native culture with the Shipibo people and have observed, and I'm somewhat guilty of this myself, I suppose, some of the kind of like uh, the idea of it's like it is a sort of touristic thing because people come there and they just want to have that experience and then they go. But what I was taken by is that there's a real depth of wisdom within the way of life of those people that often gets completely overlooked because people are so fixated on ayahuasca and the experience of the medicines themselves, where it's like, next time I go, I'd love to spend a bit more time actually spending more time with the native people, like not necessarily even drinking medicine, but just understanding, understanding the culture. The culture. Yeah. yeah, because their culture is so happy, you know, and it's it's so much more healthy than, than Western culture is. So there's a lot to learn from them. And it's not as simple as you just drink ayahuasca and then, you know, you have it all figured out. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Like there's a, there's a lot of other things going on there that makes their culture the way it is and why they're, they're such a harmonious people as a result. I mean, it's definitely true that our, our Western society is, is poisoned. And, uh, and, and if, I, as I said before, I do believe magic is a way, or maybe is the way, maybe, maybe magic is, you know, the Tantra of the West, the way out of it. It's, we, we, have, a, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Let's say it's, uh, it's going to take some time. And, um, I don't know. I want to. I want to be positive. I want. I, I've been a pessimist most of my life. Come on, I grew up being a goth, so you know. You know what it's like, right? But I'm it's still like, a goth. <laughs> you know, I mean, growing older, I want to be. I want to be positive, despite you know, again, coming out of one of the worst years to human memory. But I think that we are definitely going to a place where the more people engage with the great work. The, and the more they understand it, the great work happens at your own pace without the obsession of badges without uh, trying to you know appeal to any authority when I, when I, without trying to appeal to the to any authority telling you that you're doing good <laughs> it's just like that that might be a good way of doing it and i feel like i don't know we're getting there let's let's be positive <laughs> do, do, do you think that crowley kind of hurt the potential for magic to become more prevalent because of who he was as a personality and the kind of negative press that he got. Do you think that more people would be interested in it? Because, you know, a lot of the time 
people hear about magic or they, they hear about dilemma or they hear about Crowley and they just, they want absolutely, they're scared of it. They don't want anything to do with it because they, they think it's black magic. They think it's, it's dark. It's going to fuck up your life, whatever. And I know it's not that, but I think that his presence as, as this kind of demonic character is so pervasive that it's hard for people to get past that. And I just kind of wonder what would need to happen in order for magic to be able to stand on its own again and not under his shadow. I, I absolutely think that Crowley did more harm than good. <laughs> you know, like, um, and that's what we said before, right? You know, like he was constantly struggling between, you know, the demon Crowley and the, the master Tarion. And, uh, and I feel like at times, I feel like in fact, you know, demon, the demon Crowley won in the, in, in the, um, in the perspective of the general public. I can tell you as a fact how many people told me, oh no, I don't want, I mean, like, you seem like a good person, but I don't want, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I, uh, I, oh. I mean, like today, I'm just noting, I'm noting something, you know, memories on, you know, Facebook memories. Like three years ago, I was invited to join the Societas Rosicrucian in Anglia, which is the, you know, the, what, what created, like, then gave way to the Golden Dome. And I got initiated and then I, they, I got a mail, like a letter, that said, let's pretend that never existed because we found out you're a telemite. I mean, like that. So you can imagine, like it, it's 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 that's all down to Crowley. It is also down to the fact, you know, like how the OTO, the current international OTO, completely mismanaged the legacy. But still, it's Crowley. What does it need to happen? Um, time, time needs to happen. Uh, people like Damien becoming more of a of a figure for it. I don't know, maybe the work I'm doing, maybe the work, you know, other people are doing. Um, the people like some of my friends, like Greg Newkirk and his team, you know, creating Hellier and speaking, which is like this, this paranormal investigation on Amazon Prime uh, that became a bit of a worldwide phenomenon last year. And they speak about Crowley in it. Uh, they speak about, you know, the stars of fire and connections with you know, the liberal villages and things like that. And that was like a huge boost, like that was like massive, like mainstream boost. But then if you like, I know as a fact that a lot of people were like, oh, well, you, well, you, you, were, you were chasing ghosts now. And now what, you're like a demo, devil worshippers? We will need time. Uh, we will need a generation maybe. Uh, like, you know, after after I'm dead, <laughs> after Dam Damien is dead, after other people that like um, our sons and daughters, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever love them, but let's say the next generation maybe will will start to be focused less on Crowley and more on the on Milo Duquettes, more on the David Shoemakers. Um, it, it will take. An, I feel. I feel like we need another generation. But we are. We, that's why our job right now, our work right now, is so important because we are laying the foundation again to to what the future will be. An eon is technically 2000 years. In fact, it's much longer than that. Or, or maybe it is, you know, outside space and time entirely. So an eon doesn't, doesn't care about our mere human lives. Um, but I feel like the, each one of us who feel the call of Babylon, who feels the, like the, the connection to this tradition and this current, our job right now is to keep doing a good job not not you know not uh not becoming another demon crowley ourselves in order to not you know stain the um, the opinion of of humanity ever any further and and lay foundation for the next generation to pick up and go from there mm. like i say like the human lives is just a blip <laughs> we, we're working we're, we're working for working for higher power <laughs> right yeah yeah you need somebody who's who's like equally public and charismatic as Crowley was, but like his opposite, you know, somebody, somebody that's like really. You know what? Or maybe we don't need one person because again, I feel like the idea of like the one person always ends up into being another cult member, into being another, sure. Jesus, yeah. another Jesus, right? But Crowley wanted to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's it. Crowley wanted to be the opposite of Jesus, <laughs> but uh, that's what he wanted to be. I don't feel like, you know, but the, 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 the father God, the slain god, the, the god that you have to live vicariously through, it's an old Ioni concept. What we need, I feel, is that maybe a constellation of people that come together and keep sending the message, like, you know, 
we recognize that you know the maybe the forefather was flowed and we recognize that a lot of followed into his full steps and they're flowed that's not the message like what the message is is the good you can get out of it mm -hmm. i don't want to be i don't want to be remembered as the next crowley i'm pretty sure damien doesn't want either i'm pretty sure that uh the good people that have been doing a lot of good, I mean, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I can tell you, Lon Duquette doesn't want either. I mean, Lon Duquette has had a shot at becoming, you know, the, the audio grandmaster, and he said, no, not for me, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I met David Schumacher only once, he seems like a super decent bloke. Uh, I don't think he cares either. Like, what, what, we need more people that care about the work and not about themselves, uh, mm -hmm. which is, again, the Bodhisattva vow. Uh, we'll see, maybe I did cross that a piece. I don't know, I don't want to say <laughs> Something I, I liked in, in the preface of the Golden Dawn material that Israel Lagarde wrote is that he suggested that anybody that gets into this kind of work does psychotherapy first. And I think that that's good advice that you should it's have your, 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 you know, <laughs> you should work on yourself. Yeah, psychotherapy or whatever other methods available to kind of work on your demons and stuff like that before you get into magic because magic doesn't, doesn't cure you of those things. And it works no matter who you are. And so therefore, if you have greater distortions within yourself and within your psyche, those are only going to be magnified Absolutely. by putting it, by using these magical techniques and you could do a lot of harm to yourself and to others. I mean, I, I, went, um, I, I went to therapy twice in my life. And the first time was when I was 15 because I was reading Crowley and I was reading Jung. Uh, yeah, I didn't go out much when I was a teenager. <laughs> but like, I, I asked my mother. Cool like, hey. teenager, if you ask me. <laughs> it's like, hey, I, I would like to go to this. And my, you know, my mother studied psychology herself. She wasn't practicing, but she was. Uh, she, she had a degree in psychology. It's like, yeah, sure. So I, you know, I did. I did six months, and I, I feel that maybe that's what saved me <laughs> in many ways, um, because because when then when I had to go because I needed to sort something else with you know with my brain with with my feelings and my emotions, I was much more ready for that and uh, i do was well, something that i did i mean I, we were discussing this on my discord the other day like some of, the, of my students have been doing this for like a year very intense with me and I, I'm, I'm, i've been telling all of them like this is the moment where you might want to consider going to therapy for a while and and say what you've been doing it's not easy um it can be like it's very difficult to find the right therapist it's very it can be very expensive so you know not it's unfortunately not everybody can afford it but uh, i mean uh, if you can afford it and if you want to do magic i mean rigor this um suggestion is golden like it's absolutely golden because you will you will make more sense like you, you almost will be forced to do the famous shadow work than people try to do it i don't know on instagram and on witch talk these days no go to therapy please because there's there's professionals that can help you go in there and then magic becomes becomes a completely different toolbox mm -hmm. and it should if it's if it's real therapy and it's good therapy it should also help you identify what you might call your true will also like what it, it'll help you redefine what's actually important to you and that should help with your magical work as well absolutely absolutely i mean uh there is again I, we, we started this discussion you know, speaking about how much um you know medicine is important like magic will help you magic will give you a boost but still go to a doctor and if that's true for the illness of the bodies it's twice as true for the illness of the mind or maybe not let's not even call them illnesses but you know like finding the correct um you know, the correct balances on uh, on your on your on your emotions. the disharmonies yeah exactly the disharmonies yeah cool um well i mean this is this has been awesome i don't want to keep you too long i just wanted to ask this kind of a, a closing question because a lot of people that are listening to this don't have any experience in magic mm -hmm. what are some things that our listeners could take away and just do do right away if they're interested in this but they don't know where to start Something that I tell my students is magic starts with bringing everything down to the body, okay? Uh, the, the, the first things everybody, if you've never done magic before, what you want to really do at first is to learn to sit still for 10 minutes on your chair or lay down on the floor or on your bed 10 minutes in a dark room and just become acquainted with the way you breathe 
we often go through our days without forgetting we breathe. We live in a constant state of apnea. Like, you know, like if you think about it, have you like think think of it right now? Are you breathing right now? And maybe you are, but it's something like you do little little you know gulps pretty much. What magic? What I what I learned is that magic needs does need a fuel to happen, you know, to really uh, happen. And that fuel is what we call breath, or in Sanskrit, prana. And prana means both breathing and energy, right? So it's almost like we need to be aware of the currents of energies around us. And, that, and you do that by sitting for 10 minutes a day in a dark room with yourself, becoming acquainted with being silent <laughs> with yourself, and just listening to your breathe, and just feeling your breathing. And, and I know it, it sounds so much like, uh, what is this new age, uh, are we on Gaia TV? But trust me, that is, for me at least, that is the root of all magic. Bringing it back to the body, embodying your experience. Because, you know, you can become adept at uh, tracing pentagrams and you can create all your tools and get in fancy robes, um, memorize long chunks of text. Uh, but if you don't breathe, it's almost like there's no fuel for any of that. So if, you, if you're new to magic, uh, do, do that first. And, uh, and, then, and then we can talk about other things down the line. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Uh, so I hear you have this Avalon Con coming up. I'd love to hear more about that. And I'm sure our listeners would love to hear more about that too. Of course. Uh, so Avalon Con is um, a, a three-day convention and conference that me and my partner Riam are organizing in uh, um, here in Glastonbury next year, uh, July the second, the third, and the fourth. Um, it's gonna be. I mean, it's go it's, it's a it's a big endeavor. <laughs> uh, we have uh, like sixteen speakers and uh, many other experiences that can be um, well, can be experienced if you are able to make it here to Glastonbury. And I'm saying that because it's a, it's a hybrid, a hybrid convention. Like uh, all the speakers um, will be live streamed and recorded. So if you're not able to make it, uh, you can still watch it online pretty much well. Uh, yeah, on, uh, we're still, we're still, we're still we, 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 we don't know yet what kind of system we're gonna use, but we have a very professional AV team that's been working with um, Nat Geo. So, so like, like we have a quite, uh, we're gonna quite have like this, the, the system in place in order to give even those on, um, that kind of join us here in Glastonbury the best experience ever. Uh, this was an idea that came to me after I was invited to PhenomenaCon, um, which is basically a paranormal com um, convention on, hosted online by uh, Greg and Dana Newkirk. And I was like, oh, wow, this is a great idea. But what if we can actually mix the two things? And of course, um, COVID still is, still is a thing. So, so far, we, were, we have only been able to sell 40 tickets that got sold out in one hour. <laughs> so there's definitely a lot of interest. Uh, but we hope that after the spring, we'll be able to, to go to capacity. I mean, we, we can sell another 120 tickets. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll have a lot of people here in Glastonbury. And we have a fantastic uh, lineup, a very different lineup. When we have Damien Eccles, we have Greg and Dana Newkirk, we have John Tenney, but we have Phil Hine, uh, Amoda, yeah, <laughs> Amodali, uh, which is the best writer if you really want to understand Babylon, I feel. We have uh, Peter Gray and Alkistis Dimak of Scarlet Imprint. And then we have new faces because I feel like we need new blood. We have Georgina Rose, which is, she has a very, very good like um, YouTube channel and podcast. And she's a very young practitioner from the States and uh, like we need new people. We have Chao Wong Ku uh, as well. She has a fantastic YouTube channel and she's gonna speak about glamour magic and how uh, K-pop brings that into the, uh, you know, into the mixture. I really felt like we need, and this we, we have more. Just join on AvalonCon.uk if you want to see the full, the full lineup. We're gonna have also so like experiences for those who can make it here, and it's like concerts and uh, magical ritualistic performances. Um, we definitely hope this can be the start of something. Uh, so that maybe next year we can invite you, Jake. <laughs> because that'd, be, that'd be great to have you. Because I mean, I, I, love, I would love that. 
And I'm, I mean, unfortunately, like, like we, we, we got in touch right as we announced that. But when, when I started announcing it, of course, all the, all the, all the, the thing was already really set up pretty much. But you never know uh, if this grows up, and I hope it does, because it feels like the occult conference here in the UK is a staple. Like we had uh, Witchfest, fantastic conference, um, you know, focus on witchcraft. Uh, we had plenty of other um, events, but I feel like the it became a bit stale in the sense that you always end up you always end up seeing the same people talking about the same things or you know a, a nuanced version of the same thing. That's why I wanted to bring in you know paranormal investigators. I want to bring in you know YouTubers. I want to bring in artists because I feel that magic is the royal art and magic is all these things. Like magic is how you decode the human experience. And the human experience is all over the place, as you know. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to release more tickets, but uh, for the uh, for the in-person experience, uh, streaming tickets are limitless. <laughs> so if you, if you cannot make it to Glastonbury, UK, you'll be able to see it live or see the recording uh, by just go on avaloncon.uk and grab your ticket now. <laughs> Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. <laughs> well, thanks, Marco. Where's the best place for people to find more of what you do? So uh, my website is uh, marcovisconti.org, and it has a link to my writings, my music, and my patron. Patron is uh, patron.com slash marcovisconti. Uh, and I feel that those two, I mean, you, you can learn more of me by either reading the website, which I, I need to update. Uh, I'm a bit lacking there, and or you know joining the Patreon. Um, I've been trying to keep Patreon as very like the prices of Patreon very low in order to to, have, to everybody who can join can join just for five pounds and get most of the content out of it. There are tiers, uh, but it, that's the really like you get most of the content at, at the at the lowest tier because I feel like. Um, I feel like, I feel really feel like we 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 need to we need to to reverberate that light as we said before, and um, I do believe that's fair to to create like an exchange, so that it doesn't become vampiric. But I also I also strong believe believer that magic is for all, as I said before. So that's the best way to find me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on this podcast. This was a fascinating conversation, and looking forward to seeing more of your work and reading more about it. And also for Avalon Con, I'm sure that's going to be awesome. Thank you so much, Jake. It's been, it's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, see you soon. <laughs> cool, man. Uh, much love and thanks to everybody for listening.